Well, welcome to tonight. We welcome those that are online. We're glad that we can be able to do some things uh, in spite. If you're having some trouble at home and you are following us, then understand that the internet is out in our section of town, but we are uh, doing the work around it. I sure appreciate our men that are helping us. They've got their own class and they're taking out some time to be here. But we're in uh, Second John tonight and uh, visiting uh, with uh, some of the ladies that are in our church and you're here tonight. What a blessing. I, I in between time and before I get started on something else in a regular way, the guys are about two weeks out. We're a couple of weeks, and I thought it would be better if I started something new when we're all together. And so in case you're wondering what I'm doing, uh, that's the plan. Or if you read ahead, and some of you do, then uh, you'll know exactly what's happening. But we had some success um, a couple of weeks ago. Now, last week, of course, was our Christmas Eve candlelight service. And we were um, had a beautiful service, a beautiful time there. And then um, people have traveled since then. We've had Christmas. I hope you got what you wanted. I hope you ate what you wanted. I hope you were with people that you like. Uh, all those kinds of things for a little while. But I'm I'm always so glad and relaxed when I get back to some normalcy. It seems like I don't stay up late watching the movies. I don't, you know, uh, you don't have to catch up with all the conversation. It, I, I'm just getting old and I like normal. And so uh, that's great. So we'll uh, we'll do that and it's good. But we wanna get back to normal also with some things. But as far as the Wednesday night study and having a theme, we'll do that uh, in a couple of weeks uh, when we're all together. In the meantime, it seems like a couple of weeks ago when I was talking about uh, Hannah and dedicating your children to the Lord, it seemed like we struck a chord there. And I'm, um, as I prayed about that, I want to uh, build on that tonight. Uh, I hope that it's a help uh, all up and down the scale, whether or not you are looking forward to a time when you would have children uh, as young ladies, whether you've had children and you're a grandparent, whether you are having children or have children at home, all of those particular things, we, it, it's amazing to me how the Lord God appropriates scripture to our lives at every point where we are. Now, let me give you just a little bit of a background to this particular um, book. Uh, you've noticed it's only one chapter. 13 verses here is the whole thing. That chapter is even shorter, and this book is even shorter than some other chapters in the Bible. Uh, very comparatively, um, for instance, Psalm 119 has 22 sections of eight verses each. You just take two of those sections and uh, it's longer than this particular little book it's a letter and it's by the the person that bears its name john and uh, john is the uh, disciple he is the apostle john he's the one that was close to jesus and he has uh, two recurring themes one is love and the beloved and the other one is truth and that's the one we want to talk about tonight is truth that is worth guarding um, we live in a day where we are pretty much aware that you need to guard the truth because people want to think, well, what do I believe or who do I believe? We've heard the term, all of us, fake news. What does that mean? Somebody's lying. Or that's, at least that's the, that's the accusation. And somebody will say, well, is it fake news or are they telling the truth and the person that's yelling foul, are they the ones that are lying? And sometimes we don't know. We've lived in a pandemic this whole year, and all of us have had, had the conflicting views over some aspect of the coronavirus, haven't we? We want to know who to believe. The truth is worth guarding. Now, there's only one absolute truth, and the Bible says, thy word is truth. And we need to understand that this is worth guarding. Now, you're gonna say, well, what does this have to do them with what you just said about dovetailing into um, us being able to, um, what does this do to dovetail into motherhood and those things there? Let me just tell you that in the, in there's 99 times that this word truth is used in the New Testament. And the Apostle John is, is responsible for one third of those usages. Whenever you count them out, if you just started underlining in the Gospel of John, and you, then you read these, and you read the Revelation, which he also wrote, then you're going to come up with a, a third of those, so about 33 of those. 27 verses of 2nd and 3rd John, John here 
uh, is it's used 11 times just in these two. And if your bottles like mine, those are on facing pages. And you're, you're thinking about that 11 times uh, out of that. We're talking about one tenth of the whole pint. 10 percent of all of them are in these two pages. Um, there's no doubt the truth is something to do with the theme of these two little documents. So John writes to an anonymous sister in Christ. We don't know her name, but you could be that sister. You could be that sister in Christ. You could be the one that John was addressing and had some admonitions and some things he wanted you to know. And wouldn't that be blessed if you had somebody, an evangelist, a pastor, a dad, somebody that just says, these are some things about God I really want you to know. And how much more special it would be if the Holy Spirit was the one behind that revelation. And you knew that. Well, this is what is going on here. And we do know something, and it becomes clear as we read this. She loves the Lord. She's a witness. But stands the possibility of being swayed by a false doctrine a deceit, an untruth. That possibility is there. And so as a helper, John comes in to guard against that. And I want you just to notice some things here as we read these first four verses. Second epistle of John, the first four verses. It says, The elder and to the elect lady, there she is, and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. Already, first verse, two times. Did you see it? Okay. For all the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us, and shall be with us forever. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I have found of thy children walking in the truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. How many times did we use the word truth in just those four verses? Say five. You got it. Good job. All right. That's uh, what that's what takes place uh, in this. So out of those 11 times in these two books, five of them are right here in these four verses. Now, when you are studying your Bible, it's good for you to get a theme like that and start noticing, wow, that word's used a lot. That's the theme. Sunday night, this past Sunday night, the word was patience, wasn't it? And it was, we used it a lot. Before that, it was the people that were rich. And so you find those words, and it begins to give you the theme and the context so you can study your Bible better. You just notice what's going on. What is this talking about? Well, let's talk about this truth. Let's talk about guarding it. Then I want to make just a real simple application as to what that would have to do specifically with you ladies. Guard the truth by having a love for the truth. The Bible says, whom I love in the truth. Do people love you because you are truthful? Because you love the truth, because you love the Word of God. This relationship was based on the fact that somebody had a love for the Word of God. It, it, it was obvious to both of them. He noticed it, and obviously she practiced it. So it comes up. Now, loving Jesus and loving the Word um, that reveals Jesus is loving the truth. You love Jesus, you love the Word, because Jesus Christ is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So He is the truth. Um, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. That is what happens here with the truth. We love the truth because the truth is Jesus Christ. And so having a love for the truth, that means not just telling the truth, but it means the truth, the presentation of the Word of God. Uh, I think that's the reason you ladies are so blessed when you come to Ladies Fellowship that Miss Newport teaches, I think, and which is happening next Tuesday, by the way. Uh, and I think that's the reason why you're successful in that. It's because you come expecting the truth to be presented, and then you receive it. And you just know, I, I we're going to get something here, and not from Miss Nancy. You're going to get something that's true, and that you're going to take it home, and, and that's good, you know. Uh, for this. So, this is what Pilate, remember Pilate? He's the dude that condemned Jesus to, to die on the cross with the, you know, with false accusations. But he couldn't get his head around this, so therefore he couldn't come up with a right uh, kind of sentence. He could not get his head around the, the logic because he asked, what is truth? Now here is a prelate. 
Here is somebody that's a governor. Here is somebody that is coming to this point of, uh, you know, responsible for governing this whole area. And he is going to make decisions. And he is saying what is truth. Now, wouldn't you like to have somebody like that sitting in the Supreme Court? Now, I'm not saying we do or whatever. I'm just saying that's what that's kind of the same situation here. Responsible. And he could not get his... He, he thought that the, it was him to decide what truth is, and it's not. Um, look with, can you hold your place there and just go over to the Gospel of John real quick? The Gospel of John, verse 18. I mean, chapter 18. The Gospel of John, chapter 18. Real close to the end of the book. There's only 21 chapters there. You go to, you go to uh, chapter 18. Look down with me in verse 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. And he's answering, I, If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews? But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art, there, art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. If you love God and you are saved and you know Jesus, then you are going to be interested in what the truth is about God's word. And there's a basis to that because you don't have anything to share if you don't love the word. Now, somebody says, oh, I love my Bible. Now, sleeping with your Bible and loving the Bible are two different things. Now, I'm not trying to be crude about that. I'm just saying you can stick it under your pillow. You can do something. But if you don't open it and you don't have a love for what it says, then it does you no good. You say, oh, I believe the Bible. Okay, tell me about that. Well, I don't know. I just know I, I love it and I believe it. Well, what you're saying, what you just said to me is, is you, don't, you don't read it, you don't, you don't memorize it, you have nothing to share. So there really is no love there. Now, that's what's going on. Now, the Bible says, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not. And uh, neither... Uh, Knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you, according to John 14, 17. So that what's in you? If Jesus is in you and you know him, what's in you? The truth. The truth is in you. Now, listen to David's relationship to the word. Hold your place again and go to Psalm 119. Pretty close right to the middle of your Bible. Psalm 119. Look in verse 97, which is about the middle of that chapter. David says, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Look down at verse 113. I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. 163. I'm still in the same chapter. Just stay in the same chapter. Just go turn pages or where we need to be. 163, I hate and abhor lying, but thy law do I love. Why would the law be something you love and lying something you hate? Because the law is true. It's, it's the standard, isn't it? Look at 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Do you think David had a relationship with the word? A love-hate relationship, didn't he? He loved the Bible. He loved the Word of God. He loved. Uh, let me just tell you, you, you ladies that sing and, and do some things together. If you're not singing the Word of God or about the Word of God, and I'm not talking about quoting Scripture, but if you're not singing about Jesus, the cross, the blood, salvation, if you're singing about how you feel, that's not true. But when you're singing about the doctrines of the Word of God, you're singing what's true. And that expresses, it becomes a love song then. That's exactly what begins to happen. I, I've said this before, and I think it's so important. Um, I'm always highly suspicious of songs that begin with the word I. I, I just, my, just kind of go, where's this going? You're about to tell me about you instead of Jesus. And I just kind of get suspicious about that. Because the world's song, and the world centers around I. But we want to love him. So it revealed who he had a relationship 
Uh, it was a, it's a favorite. Is it just a good piece of literature, the Bible? No. There's a relationship. I love thy law. There's something here. I can't move on. I'm not moving through my day without it. Acts 13 says, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, is what God had told people about David. Why was he after his heart? Because he loved the truth. He loved Jesus. You can be a person after God's own heart. Now, I'm going somewhere with this. It has to do with you ladies. He that receiveth his testimony has set to his seal that God is true, according to John 3, 33. Now, loving the truth makes it worth guarding, right. putting a fence around it. Is there someone you love? If I came, and I'm just saying there's little girls in the, in the auditorium today, and I guarantee you that if I were to turn on a different personality and become schizophrenic or something, and I, I begin to attack one of these little girls, I guarantee you mothers and most of you would attack me but out of a love and a protection for that life. You would. But it seems like it's amazing. We'll hear all the lies. We'll hear all the things about the Bible. We'll hear all these things, and we don't guard the truth. We'll go to school. We'll let somebody cuss around us. We'll listen to a dirty joke. We'll have a, a practice of, of something that's uh, wrong. And when that begins to happen, we don't guard the truth, do we? Isn't that an amazing thing that, that we'll let that happen? So we need to guard the truth because it is worth, it's valuable. Buy the truth, Proverbs says, purchase it and sell it not. Then, second thing, guard the truth by having a knowledge of the truth. Now this is sometimes where we really fall down because the Bible says here in the second part of this uh, in the second part of this uh, uh, verse, first verse, but also all they that have known the truth. What does it mean to know the truth? There's a difference in knowing something or knowing about it and knowing them. Uh, anybody know about George Washington? Tell me, tell me some things. What do you know about George Washington? I, come on, speak loud. I'm old. I can't first hear you. First president of the United States. What else? Crossed the Delaware. He crossed the Delaware. Did he pray with the truth? He prayed there in, in, in Valley Forge. He was president of the Constitutional Convention. Oh, come on. His wife's name was? Martha. See, you know more than you think. Okay. He lived at? Yeah, I mean, you know you know these things. He's buried at Mount Vernon, okay? I mean, there's just, there, there are some things we know about him. He was a general in what war? The Revolutionary War. And he's on the $1 bill. We did, we know it. He, his nickname is to be the, what of our country? The father of our country, okay? Uh, so there's a lot that we know about George Washington. Okay, now, we, we all agree we know some things about George Washington. How many of you have met George Washington? How many of you know George Washington? Well, no. Nobody's met him. We know a lot about him. We could even say that about a current president, couldn't we? Right. We could know some things. We could know what color his hair is. We know where he lives. We know where he goes on vacation. We know a lot of things. We could know his wife's name. All those same similar things but we don't know him, right? There'd be a different set of, I'm not saying it's one thing. There's a lot of people that think they know a lot about the Bible, but they don't know the truth. That is a huge difference. And I'm telling you, the first thing is to be saved. You can't know the Bible unless you know the person of the Bible. Uh, in fact, the Bible talks about that. It talks about your understanding is darkened. And you'll think about it. Somebody say, oh, that's just too hard to understand. No, it's not. If you love somebody, you get to know them. You get to know them. It, it becomes, in fact, it becomes a delight. You just kind of want to hang around, you know, and uh, say things to each other and, and be a part of some things. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie of the, is of the truth. 1 John 2, 21. Uh, if you just went back a page, you'd be in 1 John. John, the gospel, says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you 
free. Do you have a knowledge of the truth? If so, it's worth guarding. It's worth guarding. Now, guard the truth by giving it a place in your life. Now, look at the things Satan, the deceiver, the opposite of truth, uh, is against. When you put truth in your life, look at this. He's against grace. Satan is against grace. And you, when you become saved, you're saved through grace, but you are saved uh, by grace. And when you put that in your life, Satan's against that thing. He's against what it takes for you to be saved. Uh, all of God's limited resources are available because of his favor towards his children. Everything that you can do or have power to do is because of God's grace. Your, the ability for prayer and answered prayer, the ability to witness, the ability to have a gift to be able to enable you to be able to do what God wants you to do. All of that comes because of his favor toward his children. The enemy has no ground to stand on and, on that and tell you, you can't do it. You need to guard that position. You need to guard that position. And we're getting close for you to understand why I would say this to you ladies. Peace. Peace means the absence of war. Boy, I, I know of homes. I know of places. I, I know of cities in America where people just burn things down. I mean, how would you like it? People come. It'd be scary, wouldn't it? Somebody comes down your street and they just throw a Molotov cocktail and you're, the front of your house is on fire. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And then you come out on the front porch and they beat you up. And we watch it on the news and go, oh, isn't that terrible? I'm just telling you, the, the, the world is crazy and they're not at peace. We cry peace, peace, and there is no peace. But we have the ability to know that there, we have a peace that passes all understanding because that's the truth. Colossians puts it this way, blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Satan is limited to what he can do in your life. So guard it. Guard the peace, guard the grace. His mercy... That means God will not allow Satan to go any further against us than we are able to bear. We just spoke of Job when we talked about patience and maturing. God is not going to push you or give you anything more than you are capable of. So oh, I just can't do this. I can't live the Christian life. Yes, you can. And besides that, you're not in charge. God gives us what we can bear. And he does that because if you'll remember in the book of James, um, every, uh, every trial can become a temptation. And what you do with the trial determines whether you pass the test or whether it becomes a temptation to fall. Every time. That's the reason we hear there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. What did they just say? Will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able. What did it just say? Yeah. You are not getting in a situation that God has not given you away because listen to the rest. It says, who will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. There, there is already a way. Most of the time, that's in Scripture, because his promise is usually contrary to the temptation. You get tempted to not be pure in your relationship. God says there's a reward for being pure, and there's a way to escape. There really is. God says that, uh, you know, that you this relationship, when you're married, it's hopeless, and... Uh, you can't submit. You can't do these things. God says that when you do, that you may win them. That's that's what first. That's what Peter says. You see, there is a scripture, and sometimes we're not going to the truth, and hopefully we'd not get in that situation if we obey the truth at first. But that's mercy. Guard it. It's it's uh, peace. Guard it. It's grace. Guard it. Truth right here. Uh, the Satan, the deceiver, wants to get into all of those things because he cannot do those things. But if you've got them in your life, you need to guard the truth. 
Now, truth has a place in your life, and it is worth guarding. But the final thing I want us to know before we bring an application to this is guard, guard the truth by living, walking according to the truth. When you look at verse 4, I rejoice greatly that I found thy children walking in the truth. In other words, do what the Bible says. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now, here's what I want you to understand. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth. Now, remember what we talked about a couple of weeks ago? Dedicating your children to the Lord. What I want you to think about and consider, and, and this isn't to jump on anything, it's to build on, okay? Dedicating your children to the Lord is a first step. Giving your children to the Lord, being willing to understand that what you are doing is important. But knowing why you are doing it is what keeps you going on, and it's because of the truth and instilling that. Now, how do you think that these children were walking in the truth? How do you think that happened? Was that just something that some decided, oh, that's a good idea, I'm going to do what mommy does? Or were some of them just kind of, you know, God gave them more spirituality than others? Is that what happened? No. Mama loved the truth and guarded the truth. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. Isn't that what the Bible says about the truth? That's what we do. That means that somewhere in your crowded being, and you know, we talk about, I know Miss Nancy has told you time and time and time and time and time again for your children to listen to the word of God while they sleep. That's guarding the truth in their hearts. Do it. You say, oh, I've got some great music and I've got classical things. I'm telling you, guard the truth. I'm asking you, I'm begging you, guard the truth. We had one of our children that by the time they were close to six years old, almost had the entire book of Revelation memorized because that was their favorite tape. And back then it was just cassette tapes and that's all it was. It kind of had an automatic tape that went back and forth. And, uh, and we'd be sitting around and I'd be quoting something and there, there go the next three or four verses. And I'm going, wow. And it would just happen because you're listening to it. Uh, guard the truth. And ladies, that's something you can do. Maybe you need to be listening to scripture. Uh, there are ways to do that. I mean, CDs and things, you're around in the kitchen, you're folding laundry, they are laying down and you're thinking, oh, I've got a few moments of quiet. Why not just listen to the word of God and guard the truth in your own heart too? I'm not saying that that makes you any more special, but if you're guarding the truth, take the opportunities that you have. Don't um, carry your Bible because you're, uh, just because I say it, and I've given you lots of scriptures tonight. You probably need to go back and mark those and have them in your Bible, just like I've got them in mine. I, I'm, I'm not more spiritual than you. My Bible says the same exact words that yours does, but you have to guard the truth. And particularly, and, and I would just tell you, young ladies, something. I'm not trying to embarrass you or whatever, but one of these days, it, it, will, it will happen. And uh, you're going to. You're going to meet some guy and, and uh, does. I, I hope all of these things are taking place in your life in a godly way. And I hope you get to come and say, preacher, we believe this is God's will and some things. But I hope I'm able to look a young man in the, in the eye and say, you know, I've watched this young lady and uh, she loves God. And there's no way that I could encourage you don't love God as much as she does. And you're going to have a lot more time to do that now than you will when you're trying to provide for husband, 
needs there, have children. If you don't have some things in your life already, you're going to be playing catch up. And, and now is a great time. And we have some godly ladies that would give you some great ideas uh, to help you with some things. Uh, some of you ladies that sing together, I'm going to challenge it before you right now. Get a passage of scripture, and the next time that you're going to, supposed to sing, uh, quote to us a passage. I'm talking about, you know, you memorize all these other songs and how many words are in that. You divide that out. You'll probably have to quote about 10 or 12 verses of the Word of God. That went over well, I can tell. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you want to get a good psalm or something, ask somebody and just stand up there. I'm telling you, it would be a blessing to you. It would be a blessing to everyone else. And you would never lose that. Just a challenge, you know, from the old guy. Uh, I'm just telling you, it might be something that's there because the time gets shorter. And loving the Word of God never, ever, ever goes unnoticed. And then when you are able to pull that little child up into your lap and read the book, and you are guarding the truth, you're not just giving your child to the Lord. You are instilling the truth and guarding the truth that's in them. And one of these days, you may not have had that opportunity, but one of these days, somebody's going to look at you and say, I noticed your children, they're walking in the truth. And then some other mom's going to come up to you and say, how'd you do that? How, how, how come your children are like that? And I'm just telling you, it's not because they hatch from a different egg. Somebody guarded the truth. Somebody did it. One of the saddest testimonies that I believe that my wife and I have ever heard was from a person that had several adult children. And they, none of them living for God. None of them. I'm not saying that they were all necessarily what we consider to be uh, wicked, but some of them had had done some things that you could not be proud of, and their parents weren't either. Some just were average good people, but just did not have a love for God. But they said, we thought that if we just brought our kids to church, that that would be enough. That's all we were required to do. You know, that they would get it at church. Let me just tell you something. I, I am not uh, bad-mouthing any of our teachers or anything. But if all you've got is 30 minutes or so to tell a story a week, that's not guarding the truth. That's not enough. That, that will not get it. Guarding the truth is praying with them and saying, what do you want to pray about? Praying with them in the morning. Praying with them when they have their snack. Praying with them when they have their supper. Daddy praying with them. Going to bed praying with them. Reading the Bible out loud showing them who missionaries are, having missionaries into your home, evangelists, that's guarding the truth. And then telling them that, did, let's read that, let's read the verse that the preacher preached about. And you're thinking, boy, that was deep this morning, and I'm not sure they can do it. You don't have to explain it. Just let the word of God, just guard the truth. Just guard the truth. And let them grow into it. I have a granddaughter that probably would be considered to be um, distracted in church. <laughs> but then you'll go later and say, what did granddad, what was he talking about? And she probably knows more than many of us in this room. And because you're, you're trained to the truth. You, you know what it is. And I'm just telling you, you ladies, you have a bigger influence over that. Let me say something else. When you're being used in our church, don't give up on the excitement that you would put in any level. I hope you never keep the nursery. I hope you never stay in the nursery. I hope you never take your turn in the nursery. I want somebody going in there as a pastor, standing at that door, following the procedures, and as those little children come in, you're sitting them down at the table, and you are guarding the truth. They need to know. You think they can't get it. 
or they won't get it, or that you are just kind of marking time, or they're too young, guard the truth in their lives. Come prepared. Come ready. Find out what you can do. Be excited about what's going to take place. Um, that, that You're going to get have a lot more fun, and people will be a lot more responsive to your lessons than they are in here. Uh, more fun than I have all the time. Uh, you know, so might as well have a great time. Guard the truth. And you have that opportunity. Now, I know what Dad's doing, and Dad's doing what Dad's supposed to do. And he should be providing and earning and having the wage. That should be happening. But when you become the keeper at home, which is what Titus talks about, when you become that, then you are the one responsible for guarding the truth. I'm going to say something here that, uh, you know, it'll be recorded. It's going out. It'll go all the way to Montana. Uh, the, uh, the fact is, is that um, I'm telling you, you cannot, you cannot pay someone else to guard the truth in the lives of your children. The Bible never says that. It doesn't happen. And by the time you think you're going to take over guarding the truth, somebody else has already had the primary influence stolen that from you. That's not guarding. And you need to know that. You need to know that now. So when you're talking to somebody, oh, we're going to do this, and we're going to have this, and do daycare, we're gonna... when you start talking that way, you need to understand that I would remind you that if you're going to see your children walking in the truth, nobody else is interested in that. Nobody else is. Except you. So, you can dedicate your children to the Lord, but if you want them walking in the truth, you're going to have to guard it. And God will give you some exciting, wonderful ways to do that. I think Timothy's mother and grandmother guarded the truth in Timothy's life. So when Paul came along, I just think it stood out, don't you? You know, Titus was a young man. I don't know who guarded the truth in his life. I've got a pretty good idea his mom had something to do with it. I really do. The receptivity to those things and just being able to, to pull those things in. They saw it first in their mom's life, and then they begin to, in their grandparents' life, because I, I would mention Eunice again, but yeah, first there, but then it shows up in the children. But we've got to guard the truth and know what it is. You see, the church can fuss, fight, people talk about, well, we've got these ladies in our church, and they gossip, and they deal with it. Let me just tell you, if you love God and you love the truth, that's not going to happen. Because you're going to be guarding the truth, and you don't want that to happen. So you're going to see to it that it doesn't. I'm not talking about fighting. I'm just saying you're going to guard the truth. We're not participating. Usually that's the best way to take care of it. Just don't participate. Okay? All right. God bless you, and God love you. Thank you so much for uh, what has taken place. Thank you for joining us online. If you did tonight, look forward to Sunday. Ladies Fellowship is next week, and if you want to sign up for that, you can call into the office, or you can also um, uh, do the uh, uh, just sign up here in the foyer, and be glad to do that. Thank you so much.